so this is Krista with the life in progress.ca. This is our take three of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here with my friend Emma Scheib of simpleslowlovely.com. We met online some a couple years ish ago. Um, Emma is the writer and owner of simpleslowlovely.com, and she has been on a journey towards a slower, simpler, and more intentional way of living since her second daughter was born about six and a half years ago. So welcome. Thank Welcome. you so much, Krista. Yeah, glad you're here. <laughs> um, Emma's in New Zealand, so she's enjoying her morning coffee with us. I am. I am. Yes. <laughs> All right, so diving right in, um, Emma, you share on your site, this is a bit of a longer quote, I was subscribed to busy and perfection and had zero coping strategies unless you count alcohol. Um, somehow, by the grace of God, hanging on a thread, I made my way through this turbulent time. When I became pregnant with our second child, and I've skipped a few words here and there, I found myself questioning my way of living. I knew that I needed some tools to help me survive, so I literally sat down one day and Googled how to slow down, and there my journey began. I wanted to start there because as much as possible, I really think we're helping people if we um, open up like with authenticity and we kind of like peel away the layers, what it looks like, and even those of us who have been walking this out for some time in, in writing about it, even teaching about it, um, and just kind of help people see that it can be messy. It's not always linear and smooth sailing, right? So Emma, I would love it if you would talk about your journey from chasing the things you thought would bring contentment toward a life of greater freedom. And what does freedom mean to you? And I'm asking because I saw you use those words, I think that maybe that's paraphrased, but something like that somewhere on your side. Mm. Um, yeah, so I guess I, ha I would have to start by um, by saying or reiterating the word journey because that is like, um, I guess the way I worded it when I wrote that, it, it does make it seem like it was like, oh, this moment in time. And I do, I have that moment in time because I have a memory of literally being, pre I think, yeah, I was pregnant lying in bed and I literally googled how to slow down but I think um it definitely came before that so I had um I sort of have had three really significant points um <clears throat> and you know the first one was when my my oldest was was two and um I was working full-time I was finishing a master's degree I was training for a an iron man um and i was you know raising a two-year-old and being a wife and you know i just had i was spread so incredibly thin and had um this but had this belief that i could do it all <clears throat> um and so not that i sort of started going oh my gosh this is too much then, but there were a lot of negative consequences for the way that I was living, which was just, um, you know, head down, bum up, like just how being on doing all the things. Um, and then, and then when I, so when I got pregnant with my second child, you know, I realized I couldn't, I just couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't do that again. I couldn't go back to, um, I guess, getting myself into the messes that I'd got myself into. And, um, what it really came down to was just that I was just trying to fill, like fill my, <laughs> my, my life. And I think, um, <clears throat> and it's not been until probably the last few years that I've realized that it's because of this um, script that I've had, this underlying script, or <clears throat> I guess like a narrative, like a, and it's a false narrative um, that I've told myself, um, the whole my whole life is that I'm you know I'm not good enough so I've got to to do things to measure up to be better to keep going um I think yeah and I think that I'm not good enough message is common like I um you see it everywhere um and it was particularly strong for me and that you know that's what just kept me going but it was just that was just a cycle so it was like do all the things, get incredibly exhausted, try and do more things, get even more exhausted, and it, yeah, just cycle, so cycle. I, I think this is a question a lot of people have, or at least a conversation they want to have, 
um, you talk about being a recovering perfectionist and that mm -hmm. not good enough. So would you say that it was primarily this internal drive that you had that was pushing you to this life of excess almost, like too busy, too much, whatever? Or do you think it was like equally, you know, that script came from somewhere. So was it external and pressure and competition mm. person? Like what, well, I guess that could be, that would be internal, but. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely both. Um, I do think that it's, um, I think it's internal and I think there's some innate sort of things like I've just, um, I've just learned about um, the Enneagram and, um, you know, what number I am and that kind of thing. And we know that some of our traits we're born with, but um, so a lot of it was internally driven, but there was some, there are a couple of significant things like um, the environment that I grew up in. Um, without going into too much detail, I had quite a traumatic upbringing and um, was um, idealized as the good, the good kid in the family. Um, and so that was a, that was another narrative that I was told. And then I think just on top of that is just the expectations of modern, it's not really the right words, but modern society. Um, like I have, I have a, a real bugbear with this whole superwoman um, narrative that we're told, you know, that, that, you know, as women, we can do it all. We can have a career. We can have kids. Um, you know, really wrestle with that concept because, yes, you can, but it's also going to be really, really messy and really difficult to try and do it all. And I just, yeah. Not smoothly or with total ease unless they have a lot of help. And I think they exactly. don't realize that. So then we judge ourselves against that story. Yeah. Parent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think going back to the bit about freedom, um, I think freedom for me really speaks to letting go of perfection um, because perfectionism has been so, such a, a strong thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of freedom in letting go of that. And it, I've definitely changed over the years and I have definitely felt um, a sense of freedom in just loosening up. Like, um, and I guess one, you could talk. One. Sorry? Enneagram one? Uh, I'm an Enneagram four. Four? Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. But you go to one in stress. Um. I don't know, maybe, yeah. A one goes to four in stress. I don't know enough about it, Christy. You 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 know a lot, but I'm just learning. I literally just did the test like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and also I think freedom for me is, and I've learned this just in the last, I guess, I don't know, six or seven years, is that it's very much about being authentic because I think when we strive for perfection, quite often we are <clears throat> looking around for different masks to pick up and put on um, to see which one fits, <laughs> um, which one's the right fit for us, rather than just um, trying to do some uncovering of what's what's really in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we only kind of touch on it briefly but you you essentially were you did get your dream job so to speak right mm -hmm. and that was the point where you just realized no actually this is not what I want right and then you mm -hmm. is that true that that was kind of a critical point and then you came home from yeah the yeah so that was like my third kind of crisis point and in this whole journey and like the journey's obviously still going. Um, but that was, um, my, I had taken on this, this dream drop. Like it was amazing. Um, I, you, I think, I don't know whether you know, Krista, but I'm really into, um, well, I did my master's degree in criminal psychology. So that's kind of, um, and I'm really into true crime and all that kind of thing. Um, but I got a job as an intelligence analyst with our, the New Zealand police. Um, and it was just an amazing, amazing job. 
um, but I was working full time and I think I started the job when our youngest was 18, just under two. And it was never my plan to go back full time, but because this job was like this carrot dangling <laughs> in front of me. Um, and I thought, let's just see if we can make it work. Um, and so I got, you know, I gave it a good go. I think I was there for three years and just ended up being completely burnt out. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so, because what's really intriguing me, and I, um, I know we want to get to all of our questions. Well, actually, the next question is even about self-awareness, and the women here joining me from the Brave and Beautiful membership know how important I see this, this level of self-awareness, understanding our wiring, and how it, we walk it out in our life in ways, and, you know, unconscious ways and patterned ways, and then when we want that freedom, right, when we start moving towards mm -hmm. freedom. Um, and one thing that in my home and just my own brain that I think a lot about is how so many of us are wired, highly sensitive. We're Absolutely. wired. We may, there may have been trauma or something like challenging in our other, in our childhood, compounding that. Um, it, then if we throw on a perfectionist nature or something like that, it's like we've got all these you know, weights we're carrying around from a really young age. and we are then measured up against or we measure ourselves up against this um, standard, this story that has been created about what a good girl looks like or what a successful human looks like or whatever. And if we can't quite keep up, um, then we feel like a failure or not good enough. So can you guys see me okay when I'm talking? Yeah, you just flicked off for a second, but you've come back now. So, um, and, and I actually want to spend not so much in this interview, but just in the next year to come really exploring this more and writing and, and chatting with people, because I think it's a, it's dangerous. And I think it's actually potentially tied to our mental health, um, mm. struggles because, um, when we have really low self-worth, we think we're not good enough that like that causes a lot of harm and, and, and I really see, because this is so personal to me and my family, like I really see that I want to help um, change the idea that, like really, really dig in and change this idea that wholeness and happiness and health like looks only this one prescribed way. And it's about the stuff and the degrees and the hustle mm -hmm. and the acquisition. And it's like some of us don't want that. We're not cut out for it. And we're gifted right? Like we're, we are gifted. We tend to be more sensitive, prone to anxiety, need a lot more solitude, but like we're doing our work. <laughs> we have gifts to bring to this world. So yeah. You want to say to that? Yeah. Like that's, I mean, you've always talked about this in your work, Krista, and that I think that's definitely part of, <clears throat> part of what drew me to you, but, um, in the first place, but, um, I, I think there's such a huge amount of work to be done to dismantle that because um, like, I feel like, you know, we do little bits here and there, but it's still so pervasive in our society that um, you have to look a certain way or even things like, um, you know, if you have a recognized issue with um, say depression or anxiety, that, that your journey is going to look the same. So, um, okay, then, well, the next step is to go and get some counselling or therapy. Um, when that might not be, you know, like it's just, there's this linear thing that's put up in front of us, but it's not like that. I think I see it more as a circle where you go one step round and a few steps back and you, know, you hop over here for a bit and then you, you know. Um, so that's what I love about your message, the, the messiness of figuring it out because really it's just figuring out I think we're just figuring out how to do life well yeah. um but not to fit and, somebody else's standard and I what I want to see is in honoring our wiring so there's room for us there's yeah. permission and there's space and possibility for for us and our children who don't fit into that other box to yeah. know you are acceptable you are worthy you are talented you are you can have a beautiful life even if even if you can't do everything that everybody else does mm -hmm. so. yeah yeah I'm really um one thing I'm doing for myself 
or trying to do for myself at the moment is to really honor that high sensitivity um, within myself. So I just wrote about that actually at the start of this week because um, I, you know, I think it's such a, I know a lot of the high, highly sensitive people around me are just really struggling with what's going on in the world right now <clears throat> on top of what we might struggle with on, you know, normal life. Um, and I think when I, you know, there was this huge sense of, well, that's not okay. And it's kind of like, I, you know, I can't feel like this and I have to figure out a way to get over it. Um, and to, and not be so affected by it, but actually, um, I want to come back to just go being okay with that, and that's me. That's who I am. Um, you want your food, honey? Come in, Malachi. I'm just gonna um, mute you, Joanne. Oh, <laughs> mute Joanne here because we can hear you. Um, yeah, Emma, yeah. I I love that. Um, and so we are going to chat more about that as we go. Um, mm -hmm. just, there you are. Okay. So I'm going to move on. So my next question yep. is, um, well, without self-awareness of our personality and wiring, our deepest motivations, our core values, and highest priorities in every season, we won't find our way to a sustainable life. So we need to know ourselves well, and we need to be willing to tell the truth about who we are, you know, our what we really need to stay healthy and so forth. Um, and then we can build a sustainable path forward. We end up being pulled to and fro by shiny ideas, comparison, perfectionism, fear. So what have you learned about yourself these past few years? And so how have you deepened self-awareness? And you've mentioned a couple of things already, the Enneagram and high sensitivity that you've learned about. <clears throat> and how has that information helped you become more rooted and courageous. And those are my words, but I like them. And they really help me feel like those are words I would choose when we're walking our path. We have to mm. kind of blinders on. It's not always easy, but we're, we're you know, following um, our path. So. Um, yeah, I mean, like we've talked about, um, well, actually, yeah, I mean, I don't even think I knew really how much of an introvert I was until about, I don't know, actually probably when my kids, when I had children, was when I really was like, oh my gosh, I am such an introvert. <laughs> um, and which was really interesting given that I had, you know, like like the whole self-discovery thing I, I think is interesting given that I had such a long time um, at university studying psychology, <laughs> um, but didn't really look in focused really your goal yeah. like, was the crime or something well, I was I was focused on getting A's not on figuring out my <laughs> you know <laughs> figuring out myself I think um and actually there are a lot of papers I wish I'd I wish I'd done um but that's okay um I'm not going back <laughs> um yeah so introversion um high sensitivity um were, were really really big like important discoveries for me because they really validated who I am and made and knowing about them made me feel that I'm okay and that I'm normal um, and I'm not crazy <laughs> um, for being the way that I am. Uh, <clears throat> but I think one thing that I'm really working through at the moment um, is this idea that I'm a paradox. So I'm allowed to be both and like I can be um just trying to think of an example um I I don't know I can be scared and I can be brave at the same moment mm -hmm. um and I think that's really important it's very important for um loosening that grip on perfection um because I think it gives us this uh it gives us the ability to take a tiny step knowing that you know we don't have to be a hundred percent um a hundred percent courageous we we also have a little bit of fear and that's okay um but yeah the, the both and thing is just like it's a real big thing in my head at the moment um i want to be able to live um 
with both of those things and not be and I think um I guess it's a little bit like the duality thing I was listening do you know Richard Raw, Krista yeah I was listening to um a podcast of his last night and <clears throat> he talked about it and um he actually mentioned and I want to look into this a little bit more but he mentioned about I guess this is in the uh religious sort of Christian context but he talked about um the duality and how often we come to that non-duality in the later stages of life so you know I'm 40 now and I feel like this is such a a big thing for um and I definitely I do see it I do see people they just loosen loosen up I suppose and not um be so narrow-minded yeah does that make sense (laughs) yeah yeah I think so I mean another reframe I mean this is all like none of this is scripted people yeah yeah you know having a real conversation here but yeah coming in kind of from another angle yeah it makes me think of um just how by the time like my husband and I I said this on a different recent interview but I when we were in New Orleans last summer in the midst of heartache and uncertainty and we were just people watching and we just said you know we agreed that anybody we see who looks like they're at least 60 they've gone through (laughs) Like, mm-hmm. it, just, it just is. Like, you can't get through this world without being a little beat up and scarred by the time you're about 60. And some of us get it a lot, you know, healthy doses earlier. But, um, but for me, I, I feel like that's probably some of the mid, midlife loosening, right? Is that mm-hmm. all the rules and all the fanciful ideas and the, you know, um, the... Think feeling that we're in more in control of life than we really are, and things like that. Well, we kind of learn the truth by the time we're about 40, yeah. 60 that oh, it's not quite so neat and tidy, and yeah. have more fun and experience joy in the middle of this mess if I loosen my grip. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, like, um, I think another, yeah, because another concept is just this idea that, um, that we're not in control, um, and that. And that life just happens, you know, life happens and we have to just, to an extent, we really just have to learn how to uh, be, how to, I guess, how to cope. I don't really want to use that word cope, but um, one thing for me at the moment is that I'm trying to, um, you know, learn a bit more resiliency to, because this, you know, that's right. I've just, this is just life. <laughs> this is just, you know, this is what happens. Um, global pandemics happen, you know, um, and you. And, and we never know. We never know what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I say rooted. So I talk about being rooted and resilient. And yeah, um, <clears throat> that's how I, because feeling rooted means sometimes I really am beat up and weary, but I know mm-hmm. I'm okay because I'm really deeply rooted. Yeah. Um, and that allows me time to rest, um, you know, when the roots are doing their thing, you know, replenishing. So even if this part of me looks a mess and, you know, I can't accomplish much in the outward world, good stuff is happening down below. And then I come on back into activity or, you know, meaningful work and things like that. So for me, that kind of picture in my brain has been really helpful. I like that. And that's kind of like, you know, the season that you're going through. So a season that a tree goes through, well, it's always going to be, have strong roots in the ground, no matter what it looks like whether it's leaves are falling off or um, changing color, you know, Um, I love that. I love that picture and that idea. And I have this big old craggy tree right out front that I just adore and it just gives me a daily reminder. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, was there anything else you wanted to share about that or were we done Um, about just learning about yourself, this new information on self-awareness and how you're using that or applying it? Was there anything else that you wanted to share? Um, and by the way, I forgot to even announce our topic. So our topic <laughs> is cultivating calm. And I said imperfectly on purpose as mm. a, because I really do want to be just focusing on the fact that not one of us do this without getting our hands dirty, our hearts mm. sometimes sore and raw and having to do some messy work. So we are talking cultivating calm. Yeah. Um, but not maybe in ways that people would think um, necessarily. So I hope this will be a, a really interesting conversation for people. Okay, but I did cut you off and you were gonna share um, 
I think, one more thing. Oh, I was just going to say, um, in respect to the topic, yeah, um, the calm, I think I started my journey, say, seven years ago, whatever, um, you know, seeking calm because I felt like things were so chaotic and like I had so many balls in the air um but I and I've probably spent the first few years really chasing the calm which is just swapping swapping things really which I think was first you know I knew that I needed calm which was a good thing and I had to go through that part of the journey but now I am again loosening my grip and going well what does calm actually look like to me? Because it won't look the same as what it looks like for somebody else. Mm. Um, so it's, um, oh, it's just, I like it. I like the journey. I like, yeah, I get excited, you know, understanding that it's just all growth, isn't it? It's just, um, it's a journey and it's fun sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. I think, well, you, you touched on this, but I really think uh, three keys or pillars of my work are self-awareness, self-compassion, and then learning to take imperfect action towards what we say. Mm-hmm. And if we stay grounded in self-compassion, then yes, I think it is fun because we're not in constant judgment. Oh, you should already know this. Why haven't you figured this out? So-and-so is doing this thing and you're not like the inner critic yapping and all the negativity mm-hmm. that can happen. But if we stay in a place of possibility of, you know, um, a growth mindset, um, yeah, in a place of curiosity more than judgment, and then, then I think the journey actually is kind of exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Um, but I just think, um, I just think, I actually think it's just the older I get, the more I, I feel like I'm en- enjoying that part, you know, this, this self discovery, self development. Yeah. Good, good. Then you've got lots of, hopefully you've got plenty of years ahead of you for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I'm changing order. I'm actually going to jump down where we were already talking about perfectionism. So I want to jump over to the final or a question later down, just in case you're tracking on your sheet. Yeah. As a recovering perfectionist myself, And a human who has, you know, from a young age, I lived with chronic pain and I've needed to work really, really hard and stubbornly for my mental and physical health. So um, have certain health challenges and also had a hard time walking, lots of pain. And then I had, I was suicidal as a teenager and I've had bouts of anxiety, including suicidality um, later in life as well. So I have, am somebody who really, truly, um, I didn't know until I don't know, maybe, I'm not sure when I really discovered this, but I discovered that not everybody has to choose to live. Not everybody actually has to make a conscious decision every day. Um, And, and some of my friends, you know, when I had good friends, they would tell me that and and in a supportive way. And I realized, oh, okay. Yeah. Like this has been hard work. Um, I don't feel right now like I'm in, I really feel like these past kind of eight years or so I have, well, maybe, maybe I'm being too generous, but these past years, anyways, whatever that is, I feel like I turned a corner and I'm no longer fighting to live every day, which isn't to say that life isn't challenging. Um, But all of this is kind of tied to that earlier conversation that for me, from a really young age, I knew I couldn't keep up. Like Mm. I, I was an honor student. I had, I didn't even realize back then how bad my anxiety was as a young person. Um, I started doing drugs and drinking really young and it's not because I enjoyed them. It's because I needed something to help me survive, calm the anxiety so I could just do life. And, um, and so we all come at this idea of simplicity. Um, I, I'm assuming we're looking for some calm, right? Like we want to slow down. We want maybe more time with our primary relationships, maybe to tend to our health. But I really do want to talk about this idea that a lot of us really have real things in our life or our wiring or bodies that mean we need acknowledgement and, and permission to say, I'm not choosing that path. Yeah. I'm going to drive over here and I'm not lesser than. Um, And so one key idea that I want us to talk about, because I feel like it's one that you'll like, 
to um, is simply the idea of figuring out that in every season, in partic these particular circumstances, as an individual, we can decide for ourselves what is enough, what does it look, sound, feel like, and it's not going to stay the same, right? So, if Vera's at home with you know young people, um, it's going to look very different from me when I'm an empty nester. So. Um, so let's just chat about that, about this idea of good enough. Um, what does that look, is that, first of all, is that something that you do kind of play with in your own life? So, yeah. yeah, well, I think, you know, like what I, I explained before, that was a, a huge thing was the not um, being or feeling good enough. Yes. Um, and... I would have, I mean, I would have to be honest and say that I, I think there's a real strong undercurrent that, that still says that, like I still have that strong narrative. Um, I'm actually working with, uh, I've just started therapy maybe three or four weeks ago, um, just to deal with some, uh, it's actually EM EMDR therapies. Do you, you're familiar with that? I think Krista. Um, and um, although we haven't actually formally started that part of it, but it's to deal with some uh, PTSD trauma um, stuff that happened um, in my childhood. So, but a huge part of that is, um, I think, going to be rewriting that script um, that I'm not good enough because I sort of, yeah, I see it. I see it still, even though I know consciously now that it is a um, a false narrative. Um, knowing it and living it are very, very different things. Do you think? Like I, um, yeah, I, I find that still very, very hard. I mean, I can I can talk about it, I can write about it, I can know in my head that I'm okay the way I am. Um, or to be living in this season, um, but but actually living it and not having the thoughts pop into your head all the time, you know, and um, and that also comes down to the comparison that we do, that we just naturally do, um, and also I would have to say, I mean, I th the external um, kind of influences that we get, um, I don't know. You'll know the work of Brene Brown. Most people know the work of her, but she. Um, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, um, she talks about um, the. What does she say? I can't actually think of the exact word that she said, but um, the story that you're telling yourself about what someone else is thinking, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that um, I always tell myself a story that 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 the other people in my life are thinking that I'm not up to scratch. So it's about rewriting, not just the script you're telling yourself, but rewriting that, that idea as well. Yeah. 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 yeah I've needed to do this, but my forties, I'm turning 49 in a few weeks and my forties have really been about that work learning mm -hmm. you know, a place where, yeah, I actually love myself, love my body good enough. Do I ever raise the bar on myself? Oh yeah, I do it. Cause I, I don't mm -hmm. think perfectionism goes away. I think we put it into remission and then when stressors come up, we can notice it kind of creeping back up there and we kind of have to say, okay, like, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, um, but I feel like it's, uh, I feel like that can be encouraging for anybody listening to you because even if they don't feel like it's perfectionism, it's like, we're all just always practicing. Like this is not about an end point. This is about mm -hmm. gathering awareness, growing, tipping back into old patterns, loving ourselves forward. Like, you know, it's, it can be gentle and kind. Yeah. And to use something that's been there from the very beginning. And yeah. And I, I would have to say as well that it's, um, you can be perfectionist in some areas of your life still heavily. And then in other areas you can loosen up. So I think that, um, you know, this very practical aspect of like um, running a household, <laughs> you know, keeping things super clean and tidy. Well, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> so I'm definitely not a perfectionist with that. But like, um, I'm st I still 
strive with things like um, my running or my physical activity when that's not necessarily very good for me. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's just, um, yeah, I think it's nice to know that you can be working on it in some areas and still be, still have, you know, yet to get there in, in other places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's go talk a little bit about the messiness um, in the discussion around slower, simpler living. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to pause for one moment. Emma, I didn't ask you before, but um, there are only four people listening. Uh, would you mm -hmm. have time at the end if they have a question, just in the event that anybody has a question? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. You don't have to pick up schools, kids from school right now, I guess. So. No. It's only 10, 10 20 here. <laughs> um, and they may not have any questions, but I just, yeah. just came to me. So um, we chatted a bit about how, yeah, this, it is a complex issue. It's a messy issue. And for like so many reasons that we, we in no way can actually really discuss today. Um, but I know that I, because I really do value integrity and I, and I know that my life has not been what I see sometimes online. You know, the, some minimalists talking like with this very kind of wealthy appearing lifestyle and, you know, brand new kitchen. And I don't know, just all these things that I'm like, nope, that's not our life or whatever it is. And, and, and I can, you know, for me, I've been around the block enough times and I'm old enough to realize that's not the full picture. And it is for some people, but it's a, I get to choose my own path, my own good enough. Um, but my life has been messy. My life has been beautiful in so, so many ways, but lots of struggle, lots of losing people, lots of heartache, like, and challenges and, you know, and um, so I am driven to a slower, simpler life or, or, or really working at this idea of cultivating calm and, and really where does calm come from? Mm -hmm. But really for me, it's been about learning to find that calm in the middle of the storm, not when life is, you know, you get a three month reprieve. It's really about showing up fully to life um, in the middle of the fridge breaking, your child is sick. Oh my God, somebody left their shoes at home and I have to drive them to school and you have a meeting at like, you know, whatever it is. Right. Or um, um, here I talk about like single moms you know, working several jobs to take care of their babies. Could be somebody living in an inner city somewhere without access to, you know, resources, without, you know, and uh, there's some kind of like injustice, oppression that prevents them from getting a good job so that they can, you know, move out of this hustly lifestyle. Um, I also think of friends though, who have really kind of more demanding jobs and they don't want to give up that job, you know, so then the solution isn't for them to come home necessarily, but it is maybe to know I deserve help and then getting mm -hmm. what you need. So it is complex. Like what, what even if, if we're talking about like different socioeconomic um, situation, different like surf, life circumstances, or even our different stages of life right? Like mm -hmm. um, as I move towards 50, like I have my youngest only has three years and she's graduating and we're going to be like in this nest, nesty imp. I, I'm flipping all my, <laughs> all my phrases today, an empty nest. Um, I'm actually kind of looking forward to that. I'm curious what that's going to be like. Um, but each season of life is really different too, isn't it? Like our financial, yeah. all the things. So, um, so one, I think we, we agree that we want to address at least this idea that it's not, not quite so simple as maybe we make it out to seem on occasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like, I think that's why I resisted. Um, I resisted Instagram for so long because it felt so full of um, perfect squares of, you know, and of course, you know, that's not actually what their house looks like you know 95 percent of the time and they've just done a huge cleanup or whatever but um also just the idea that um and I think that's probably why I don't I mean I do talk about minimalism but I don't focus on at a whole heap because um I I whilst I myself 
I have always um, tended towards uh, sort of tidy environments and less in my environment, and that is partly because of my high sensitivity. Um, it's not always possible, like um, to. I'm just trying to think of, you know, like I think there's an idea that um, for you know to be completely minimalist, you can get rid of everything that you're not going to need in the next three months. Whereas someone that you know is living more week to week doesn't have um, a huge amount of uh, disposable income. They're going to keep those things because they might need them in a year, and they might not be able, you know, so all of that stuff but the this I think it's it's really this idea of slowing down can also be put on this pedestal of um and I think it kind of was for me because I at the start I desperately you know wanted and needed and so I I did kind of look at, at those things and think oh man that's just that would be so amazing to live like that but what I've learned I think is that um it's not about what's on the outside <laughs> It's not about whether you can um, have a cleaner in or whether you can reduce your hours to only 30 hours a week. It's actually about what's in here because what's in here you're always going to have with you. So it's about learning to cultivate that calm place that you can go to um, no matter what's going on around you. Um, so actually it's kind of similar to um, in the therapy, the EMDR therapy, they talk about um, your one of the things that they get you to do is to figure out a safe space where you can go to. And I feel like that's what I want to do with my slow life style is, I think it's a little bit similar to your rooted, your idea of being rooted, but it's that, um, that calm space that's right in here um, that you can withdraw back into. Um, and for me, that's a lot, a lot of it is about just kind of noticing, like being just increasing my awareness um, and noticing. And I feel like um, we get distracted by the other things that we can sort of do to um, maintain a slower lifestyle. Because um, yes, you can um, stop scheduling so much. You can, um, you know, like, and I do those things, like my kids only, they're only allowed to do one extra well not only allowed to but only encouraged to do one extracurricular activity a term um we you know, i've i've um you know i've worked very hard at, at getting good at saying no and that kind of thing but the foundation is still a sense of calm within within me that i can come back to yeah so um so one of the ideas that I do want to chat further, I think we were kind of entering in there and I just want to go a little bit further, mm -hmm. would be to offer ideas that anybody listening can consider. They may be in wildly different life circumstances than you or I, um, and you and I are in different life circumstances, one mm -hmm. from the other. So kind of trying to find some common ground where people, even if they feel like, okay, well, we're a dual income family and I actually can't, like, I can't give it up my, my job. I, I don't want to, um, or, you know, you're tending to an aging parent, like whatever. And you can't just give up everything that's causing us stress or making us busier and, and things like that. So I would love to just come up with some ideas and you may already have some percolating, um, mm -hmm. that people could consider that might help inch them to a bit of a slower, simpler life, but is still acknowledging the messiness or the complexity of their individual situation. So mm. yeah, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I was just checking. I've made a few notes. Um, I, I think one of the big things for me is around the idea that um, we can be in, I want to say, and I've written down that you aren't powerless, but I think that can be quite a confronting statement to tell someone because often we do feel very powerless with the situation that's going on around us. So I'm not sure if that's 
I try to be very gentle with the way I word things and that feels a bit confronting, but um, so maybe rather to think that you can be in the driver's seat of your life um, and it's, you know, it, it's possible to be and that it's okay to be. And so I think, I guess that's really about intention. So for me, it's around, um, I'm trying to think of a real practical, <laughs> um, a practical sort of way to say this, but um, little tiny bits of intentionality every day. Um, personally, I do that by, so really practically, um, taking really deep breaths so being very intentional about my breathing otherwise I just I breathe up here all the time and I don't breathe enough <laughs> um, and also just um, taking uh, taking space like taking up space before I answer when someone asks me something or taking a few seconds to think through things um, um, <laughs> And noticing, I think, is a real powerful thing for me. So I guess that's mindfulness. So actually um, noticing the environment that I'm in, that I feel like that does an amazing job at making me feel like my life is going at a slower pace. It's kind of hard to explain, I think. But um, if I actually intentionally put my focus on what's happening around me rather than just what am I going to do next, what like, constant, I guess it's about being present, being in the present moment. Um, those are things that I have really uh, tried to hone in on and I think that they are relatively easy if you compare it to like oh, I'm going to quit my job you know or yeah they're attainable like they really are attainable if you just practice it a little bit every day yeah and so the mindfulness is huge in my life um and yeah, I share it a lot, like just the importance for me to ground myself, feel my toes, even like literally like squishing the carpet mm -hmm. or whatever, noticing when my brain is heading back to the past, kind of just circling there or skipping ahead to the future and just saying, no, right now I'm safe. Mm -hmm. right now, I have everything I need right now. I just have to focus on this little bit of path ahead of me. That's all. Um, um, and the idea that I brought up earlier of even just saying, you know, this is good enough. I use that a lot. So what I deem good enough in this like month is different from three months ago, one year ago. Like, um, and of course that's going to happen when our world is in upheaval and there's lots going on. And, and I think actually being rooted is helpful because if you think of those deep roots that hold you fast, it's like, even if you're heaving a bit and you're having to like, figure your way you're okay like I yeah. have a confidence that I'm okay um because and I can be more flexible because my roots are fast mm -hmm. so that's really helpful for me um another thing that I thought of is I really find that um so I'm a huge fan of dawn and dusk rituals or morning evening routine mm. where they're really simple so they're not these complicated things. They could be accomplished in 20 minutes max. You could take them with you. Your child's in the hospital. You can do it in the hospital. Um, you're on the road. You can take it on the road. Like it's really low hanging fruit, but it really helps us begin and end our days with intention. And I do think that we can do this, whether, you know, we have enough money or we're in lack, if life is an upheaval or we're in relative ease. Um, you know, if you're just flat out not safe in the world, you're not going to be thinking about a morning routine. But so we're, we're assuming basic mm. relative safety. Um, and, but I find that, you know, because for me, they, they compri they're comp comprised of four to five small little habits that are, yeah. help set the tone for my day or end it well. And even if I did nothing else, if my life was just, an, you know, really chat hard the whole day but i take those few minutes in the beginning and i take those few minutes in the end it really calms me and what i noticed this past year because i have some really good rhythms and routines built into my life is i really felt like they anchored me so i couldn't control a car accident i couldn't control all these other things in my life I couldn't control a world global pandemic but what could i control these tiny little habits that I didn't have to think too hard about because they were so ingrained in me 
Um, and they just, they were powerful enough because of what I choose to put in there that they make me feel even a sense of agency and that alone. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. I love that. And I actually, I think the sense of agency is better than this whole idea of having power in your life. Um, but I love that. I love, I, I like, honestly, I am not, I do not at the moment have a good morning or evening routine. Um, you know, I could blame it on the pandemic, but really it's just me, <laughs> me being slack. Um, but pre pandemic, I had such a lovely um, routine, which I'd really like to get back to, um, which was to get up and, and, and this is like not, this doesn't it's not much at all but it was just to read first thing in the morning like actually read a book so sit and read with my coffee um instead of bed right put him climbed back into bed for your reading. yeah um yeah most of the time depends it kind of depends what season it is um and um you know I often just like to read in front of my kids as well um just to you know, this is how I'm starting my day. It's that whole idea of role modeling for them um, while they're sitting there watching TV or something. <laughs> um, but it was, it made such a huge difference. Instead of going onto my phone or onto the laptop um, to check emails or, you know, and it's real simple. It's so simple and it makes such a huge difference and I need to get back to it. I haven't quite yet. Um, but the other thing that I found really powerful um, when you're thinking that you've got, you know, chaotic, busy life, um, something that I found really powerful to do um, last year, and I think I went into this year doing it, but again, it's fallen away, um, was just to take a few moments writing at the end of my night, like just writing, I would write three things that have happened during that day that I've noticed, so not even necessarily gratefulness, because I find that I found that a bit hard sometimes. Um, so loosening up on the idea of a, a gratitude journal, but rather just what did I notice today? What, what can I see that was in my day? Um, and then three things practically that I need to do the next day. Um, and that, again, it just made me feel um, like, I, like I'd settled within myself and that I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I would sleep easier, um, go to school, sleep easier because I feel like I've kind of booking, booking did my day, um, and attended to myself just a tiny bit. Yeah. Um, but that's not much, you know, and I, I have, I have ideas of amazing morning routines, but it is hard. It is hard with young kids. Like, I mean, it's easier. It's a little bit easier now that my daughter's six and a half, but I really struggle like I feel I mean I was so hard when I had really little you know really little girls and thinking I really want my morning routine but how can I you know I just wanted to stay in bed when I've been up three times in the night so yeah um when I started my business I did um about 80 percent of my work in holistic or functional nutrition and, um, and we still, we talked about morning routines and lifestyle changes, but a lot of my clients had ch young children. And so I said, you know what, D just postpone your morning routine, get them off to school, do whatever, get them playing and then sit down. It's okay that it's not first thing in the morning because exactly. that, uh, that early in the day you're saying, Hey, I matter. This really helps me show up to, to life more fully and on, on purpose. And yeah. so. It's okay. And that would be another example, right, of being more flexible and loosening our grip and not mm. letting perfection kind of tell us, well, it's all this way or, or the highway. <laughs> it's all or nothing. Yeah. Like it's lovely to think, oh, you know, an hour morning routine where I do this and then I do this and then I do this. But actually, mine is like, okay, I might read for 10 minutes, then I'm scrambling to get lunches and kids out the door. And then I, once I've dropped them at school, then I get to go for my lovely run with my dog, which is a huge part of my. Um, looking after myself and that does come into my morning routine but it's just it looks a bit different you know than what it would <laughs> yeah. yeah I actually really love that example so so again I guess we're just reinforcing the idea that um, 
we think that as long as you are, you're basically safe and you have a basic sense of enough, right? Like in safety, mm -hmm. enough, in danger, in crises, whatever, um, that you could look for ways, pretty much any of us could look for tiny, tiny little pockets of time, um, maybe to pause, take a few deeper breaths, check in with ourselves, maybe begin a, a really easy morning, evening routine, maybe some structure and, you know, a bit of structure um, helps you feel more anchored. Like that I, that I think for me, I, I love looking for ways that at least for more of us, it's like, it's not about one prescriptive way of being in the world or living yeah. can or cannot control depending on the circumstance. But there are always these other things we can kind of carry with us into different mm -hmm. seasons of life. And the more we practice or water some of them, they put down roots and then they really help keep us mm -hmm. in, I think, when life is really hard. So our final question, Emma. Um, uh, so we're talking again about cultivating calm. And um, yeah. in the Brave and Beautiful membership this month, the focus is cultivating calm. and. Um, but it may, it, it's not necessarily what some people were expecting. And that um, really, I'm not at all talking about trying to remove stress, find ways of living in a bubble. I'm talking a lot about moving towards the things that we're excited about, the values that are the strongest for us, um, our priorities for the season of life. And when we move towards these things, we we will encounter stress, anxiety, and discomfort. And I think this is a, a really important idea. Like, this is how I live my life. I believe this is necessary. And I think that because in our world, we have a tendency to almost compartmentalize ideas or information. It's like, sometimes we're not telling the full truth, right? So we're talking about stress mm -hmm. is bad, it causes inflammation, it's not good for this. So then, ah, all stress is bad. When mm -hmm. the is loving somebody, sharing life with a partner is going to involve stress. Having children is going to involve stress. Um, just being alive in this world is going to encounter stress. Um, but And then saying yes to a new business venture, saying yes to, you know, going on a, I don't know, diving into something new when you turn 50 or 60, like um, that there's going to be some stress and anxiety and uncertainty and i don't want to live my life hiding from all of that so for me cultivating calm is really about um the slow and simple living helps me do that but it's not because i'm avoiding stress it's because i'm kind of like sifting through and peeling away all the unnecessary stuff so i can say yes to a few particular things and then move towards them imperfectly on purpose um, and that is, and it means understanding that stress isn't going to kill me. I'm not doing life wrong because it's stressful. Yeah. Um, I, I really think, I don't, for me, there's, and I think for a lot of people, there's a, there's this huge resistance to, um, I mean, because we hear all the time that stress is so bad for us. And then, so there's a huge resistance to, Things that are going to cause stress when they come up like it's just it's such a I don't know a negative thing and and we seem to be wired to to fix like we're just I mean not everybody but um you know or we have to fix this issue that's that's come up rather than just sitting with it because um like we said, you know, you can't get through 60 years, you can't get through 80 years without having huge challenges and things happen to you because that is what life is. So I think it's more learning to live with that. And I think it's a lot about, for me, I just have to really start to accept rather than resist um, the things that are happening in my life. Um, and yeah um i guess knowing that i'm not in control but i'm i'm not in control of the external things that are happening but i am in control of how i can react um and how then i can um what i can do after that i'm just, i'm trying to think of a practical um example my own life but i well okay. i can't 
just popped into my brain back to the nutrition thing. I'm thinking of one of my friends and they did a lot of, um, she wanted to, well, she had a big garden they hunted, but they did a lot of sort of going through drive throughs McDonald's drive throughs and things. And um, I made a suggestion. Um, so this will be kind of teasing her a little bit, but she, mm-hmm. I've already said it out loud in front of her, but um, at one point I was encouraging her to keep snacks like organic cashews and like dark chocolate bars, like in her car, like you just acknowledge and or granola bars. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah. Just, Cause I'm like, you know, their kids are always hungry and you, what you don't want is the going through the McDonald's. So give yourself another option. And I remember it coming out of her mouth, but that's not, it's like, that's not good enough. Cause she wanted to go from zero from oh, yeah. over to this other idealized thing. And I was like, okay, hey, but that's not going to happen. You're going to quit in one day. <laughs> yeah. Into your way. Like, you know, if we find some, um, make some peace with sort of this land of gray here, all of this mm. we have between, you know, abject failure and idealized success, whatever the heck that is. We've got yeah. all this play and be and test on ideas. <laughs> it's like our whole life is gray. I don't think, you know, nothing's black and white. And we, um, I think that's where we live like 99% of the time is in this area where we're just moving we're just slowly moving around in this in this kind of swampiness of the messiness of of life, and yeah, so I think it's learning to accept what's happening, but then taking tiny steps with that acceptance in mind, I guess to progress yourself, yeah yeah and yeah. just a final idea I'll share because I actually think maybe i it would be helpful to people um would be that I really do encourage everybody, if you haven't done this already, to identify your top three to five values for this season of life. Like it may not be for all of life, it may be for this year, this chunk of years, whatever, but um, write those on a sticky note. And then whenever you are needing to make a decision, you could check in with those values and just see like, oh, would this, you know, maybe you don't have, maybe you're too rushed in the morning, but like later at night, you have a few minutes to do this work, you know, after mm-hmm. the, because we just learn as we do this. Right. So and say, well, did that idea move me closer to these values or not? And then well, what, what could I do next time? So we're not beating ourselves up. We're just looking for opportunity to walk out our values. And also like in hard seasons of life, I have found that really helpful because um, again, that sense of agency, which actually research really shows us how much it matters to us and mm-hmm. happiness in mental health and so forth. Um, that's really helped me this past year, two years, three years. Um, and so, um, oh, I'm getting off track. I was moving. Oh, Emma, what was <laughs> um, You're yeah. talking about the values. Yeah. So writing down your three values. Um, each season is that what you said I think well, I, I work in seasons, so I just say whatever my season of life is like so this yeah. year in particular or these past few years have been very particular um, but then what I notice is when life feels really overwhelming and it's like all these things are out of your control um, what I what I noticed was one of my one of my um, my I call them mind body spirit intentions for the year is um, integrity and just always this is it carries over year to year And what I saw was I could always, in integrity, walk out my values, no matter what was happening. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I was at my healthiest. I'm not saying I wasn't scared out of my mind. I'm not saying like life wasn't really, really painful. But in in no moment was I forced to move away from my values. And -hmm. and so that was, and I'm not saying it couldn't happen. Sometimes our values even come in conflict with themselves. But that actually really helped me. It's such like it's a free thing that you can just hold in your hand as we move through any circumstances. And, and, and so, but it's going to require, I think, letting go of the story around it has to look one way. It yeah. Yeah. Because, and yeah, and that it has to look the same. I like my values now look, will look different to what they're going to look like in 10 years, but that's different. I talk about, um, uh, I talk about your why a lot, which is I think just you know what your values, what your values are. But when people are wanting to seek that slower lifestyle or they want to move towards being more minimalist, then I think that you have to start with your values and why you're even wanting to do that. 
um, and really build on that foundation because that is what you'll go back to when <laughs> when things um, inevitably you know the wheels start to fall off you have to have that strong foundation of um, and, and it doesn't need, to, I think it's good to identify a few prescriptive things, but it can be a lot bigger than that and you can allow it to change, you know, through your different um, seasons. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And honestly, like when I had little kids, you know, you'd think, oh, I got, the, I have this, whatever it is under control now. And three months later, they change again. So yeah. I thought, oh yeah, as they get bigger, you have these longer stretches of time, like maybe like a year, but I'm like, ah, if only, but really yeah. I, like, still I check in seasonally because it's like really every few months I notice, oh, something else is, you know, and I need to just adjust a little bit to just make sure that I'm really where I want to be and heading and prioritizing even mm. Where do I expend my energy? Like I have very little to give right now. Um, so what's most important, you know, and yeah. continually doing this work. So, okay. Um, are we okay to ask a few questions? And then I just have one final question or at, see if anybody wants to ask us questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for being willing. I'm going to unmute everybody listening. And so Kelly, Vera and Amy, there is just a few of you left here. Do you, any of you have a question? Unmute. Well, I'm trying to unmute you. So I don't see you. So that's why I'm unmuting you. So you can, this isn't working. <laughs> Vera, you're unmuted. You have yeah, a... I'm here. No questions from me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, nothing from me either, but thank you very much, Emma. And it's, I'm in New Zealand as well. So it's so nice to have another community. Okay. Oh, who's that talking? I can't even. I... Oh, my video is frozen. It's Vera. Oh, yay. You're in. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Whereabouts are you in New Zealand? Uh, I'm just out of Dunedin. So oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Is it freezing down there? Uh, it's five degrees. So <laughs> a little cold oh. today. <laughs> I'm so excited that another. It's so cool when I. Yeah. Other New Zealanders on here. That's very cool. <laughs> So Kelly, you said no questions. And Amy, what did you say? But thank uh, am I am I on? I can't tell. Am I muted or not muted? You are. I can hear you. I just don't see you. Can you hear me? Okay. I, um, Emma, thank you so much. I really enjoyed what you had to say. I just I would like to add a little perspective as someone who is old enough to be both of your mothers. <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> I wish that I had discovered a group like this 20 years ago. Um, I've had my share of challenges, but um, it's never too late. And, um, you know, I am as well a recovering perfectionist, but I also struggle with being, uh, why does everybody have to be a type A? I'm really a B. <laughs> and that it's okay not to do it all. So that's, that's what I've got to say. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Thank you. That's really cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, Emma. So you can just hold on and I'll end our recording and we'll say goodbye to everybody else. And before we do, you, um, my question for you is what's one final thought, bit of wisdom, or a word of encouragement you, like, you would like to offer everybody listening at a later date? If they're seeking a slower, simpler, lovelier life. That's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, I am going to... I think pretty much steal from you, Krista, <laughs> because I think this is a phrase that I've actually got from you, but I feel like I've been using it a lot in my life lately, and that is just loosen your grip. <laughs> um, on, you know, loosen, yeah, just loosen. I guess it speaks to the perfectionism thing, but yeah, loosen your grip. I, I'm pretty sure that's you that, have, <laughs> that has said that, but I, yeah, that's, that's my, that's it. I'm an Enneagram <laughs> one. Perfectionism and not feeling good enough is a driving thing in my life, um, or has, you know, used to be in particular. And again, our one moves to the four, especially in times of stress. And I've spent a lot, a whole lot of time over there in four land, in especially my early 20s, or my 20s in general, probably. <laughs> so, where can people find you? What's your favorite place to hang out? Um, so I am, I have a website, so that's just simple, slow, lovely dot 
Com, um, and I do send emails um, once a week-ish. <laughs> I like to keep it all-ish, um, Monday-ish. Um, and I'm probably most active on Facebook, so you can find me there, but I'm also on Instagram as well. Um, I try and hang out there. Those are the three main places I don't do. I don't do Twitter, I don't do anything else like that. Try and keep it fairly simple. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks.